9.30, I'm looking forward to Bible class with you this morning. I do believe that uh, if you had not, uh, if you, many of you have mentioned you haven't seen Juanita Ferguson for a little while. That is because she, for about the last six weeks, she's been battling COVID. So she is, she seems to, she feels like she is, it's, she feels like she is on the upswing and improving. So uh, keep her in your prayers, though. I know several of you have already been praying for Juanita, uh, but we hope to see Juanita soon. Um, Joe's, Joe Brown's mother was found yesterday. She had a stroke, and they took her in, and she did not survive. So for Joe Brown lost his mother. She was from Tyler, Texas, or that area. So uh, keep Joe in prayer and uh, his family. Let's, uh, let's begin with a brief word of prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word and for Joshua and the message that you brought to us through this book. But Lord, we ask that you be with those who are in need in our con congregation. Please help Eddie Morris through his bout of, recent bout of COVID. Please be with Juanita Ferguson and help her through this illness. And please be with Joe and Penny Brown as they mourn Joe's mother. Help him through the decisions that have to be made. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I like to ask you a question so that you start the talking instead of me. Our question for this morning is, where would you, do you want to go that you have never been in your life? And why? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? Heaven. To heaven. I definitely want to go to heaven. Yes, the alternative is not worth thinking, and there's no place better. I'm not talking to his brother. I'll go about those seizures. Mm -hmm. I've got to make God seizures. Now I'm not going to There'll be no say, more seizures. I young, I would say God when y'all pray. God's seizures will be say, gone. I would say God's seizures. I mm -hmm. say young. Yes, yes you do. That's what they'll be telling me anymore when y'all say young. Mm -hmm. That's what makes me keep having. So I would say God's seizures. Live them to God. Pray. Well, that, that may be part of it. What were you, where do you want to go? I want to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven too? Amen. Well, Amen. we all want to go to heaven. Is there any place a little more local some of y'all want to go? Want yes. To go to the, the, Holy the Holy Land. I loved it. Why do you want to go there? That's where Jesus was. That's where Jesus walked. Yeah. I'd love to be those, those places as well. Who else would like to go? Where's some, one place someone else has never been and like to go? Yes. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. Me too. And I drove right past <laughs> Buffalo, New York once and didn't find the time to stop. Why do you want to go there? Well, because it's in the United States and I yep. used to want to go outside of it, but I don't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's within the United States, so you'd like, you feel a little safer doing that. Yeah, I, I, I might too. Yes. Ireland besides heaven. Why do you want to go to Ireland? Well, because for years my wife and I have always enjoyed going to like Celtic festivals and stuff and so to see it firsthand. That would be the ultimate Celtic festival if you enjoy Celtic festivals. Any other locales somebody'd like to visit they've never been. Never ever been. Mm, y'all y'all been well traveled. You just fulfilled all your need. Yes. Oh. A cruise, a cruise. Glenda wants to get me on a cruise one of these days. We'll see how that, well, eh. <laughs> okay. They're fun. I hear you can eat all day long. <laughs> Sounds almost like heaven. Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. Unfortunately, the dieting afterwards may not be so much fun. Yeah, that may be the only way. She's, she's had a lot to say about the different meals available, especially the free ones. Yes, yeah, they're already paid for meals. <coughs> Pardon me. We're in Joshua chapter 3 this morning, and they are about to go where they have never been before. And so that phrase will be a part of our reading today. Then... Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. 
he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be, there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I'll begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, I will be with you. This is Joshua chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. You can see I've put the numbers right up there at the top. Okay? So, question number one for you. Why did they have to keep 2,000 cubits away from this ark? They're not nearly close enough to touch it like Uzzah. That's a good point. If there's a be a stumble, there's no no chance somebody's going to reach over and touch it. Yeah. Yes, John. It is a very deadly and highly religious symbol. Yeah, it, it represents the awesome, unlimited power of God. And John wouldn't come within 3,000 cubits of it. Now, give me an idea of what a cubit is. Fingertip to elbow, depending on, and they did standardize that. Um, that's the origin of it. Like a foot is a foot. A span is a span. Um, but uh, roughly 18 inches or sometimes a little closer to 20 inches or a little bit more, uh, depending on what society was doing that. But if we were going with 18 inches, 2,000 cubits would be 1,000 yards. We're talking about 10 football fields. Stay 10 football fields away from this. So uh, we're, we're talking in a, a pretty good distance. You'd be able to see it. But you stay as you stay a long way away from this thing. Um, tell me, there's a very vague command here: sanctify yourself. How would you do that? If we were to say, "Sanctify yourselves, brethren," we're about to appoint elders. We're about to appoint deacons. We're going to look for a new preacher because that other one, he's a bum. Okay, you know, we got to find it. We got to do something different. Sanctify yourself. How would you do that? Pray. About pray. I, I say pray also. Going to pray. That's my question. Yes. We're going to talk I'm about it. Pray, yeah. We may be talking about the Lord a lot more. And, he would. That's not a good and if you've got a copy of his word, you'd read it. You'd read whatever you've got. Remember, they were supposed to be making little copies of God's word, little bits to go and on their mantles, that to go with before their frontlets, they were supposed to constantly have God's word in front of them, so they'd be focusing and studying, sanctifying. Anything you wouldn't do that people tend to do? Anything that would be considered unclean. Anything considered unclean. Something, anything unclean you're not supposed to do. Now, they weren't allowed to eat unclean things anyway, but what 
Are there any activities you do that you change or yes? Okay, and in Exodus 19, as they come to Mount Sinai, they're told how to sanctify themselves, and they were to wash their garments, and even though they might be married, to refrain from sexual activity within marriage, even for a time. So there's a lot of different things we can do to focus on prayer. Hi, Sergio. Welcome. I'm so glad that a friend of mine, Sergio, has come in. Y'all be nice to Sergio. Be nice to him. He's not quite done with my house yet. So y'all be really nice to Sergio. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but, uh, you know, there's lots of things. Are there things we do that are just for ourselves? Dr. Pepper is one of them for me. Man, I like that. Dr. Pepper Zero. That is good stuff. But if I wanted to focus on the Lord... That might be something I would give up in fasting in that way. Would they, would they have the same normal diet and, as they would every, every other day? Or might they do some fasting as they sanctified themselves? I don't know what it would be. Is it, aren't we supposed to be sanctified all the time? And holy all the time? But God wants me to. God wants me to. But are there times in our lives that we really need God's guidance, God's help, and we, we want to get closer all the time, but we have a decision to make. What kind of decisions do you make that would drive you to your knees, would drive you to sanctify yourself a little bit more? Being baptized into Christ. It would express his Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, those are good. Studying his word, yes. Okay. Studying your Bible is a real good thing to do, too. Yep. Mm -hmm. let's, let's give somebody else a chance for just a minute. John, what do you think? Uh, what do y'all think? What, what occasions take place? He mentioned being baptized into Christ. That would be that first decision that's really important. Yes, Glenda. The question is, here they're ready to cross the Jordan River. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know what's going to happen, but they're told something amazing is about to happen. Sanctify yourself. What would cause you to want to be a little more holy today than you have been before what what kind of decisions come up in life that you really need to pray about or do we sometimes neglect to pray about them we ought to sanctify ourselves before these big decisions Big decisions about transitions. Yeah. Is God going to be part of this? What, what? But they were making a big transition from one side of the Jordan to the river. They are now fulfilling the promise. And we sometimes have big transitions in our lives as well. We've got Jordan rivers to cross. We actually have used the Jordan River as a, uh, as a figurative, uh, as a figure for death. I don't really like that because here they're changing from one kind of life when manna has been present, whenever God, they've been living in tents, whenever they're, they're looking forward to conquering the land, now they're about to fulfill those promises. There's moving before you ask somebody out on a date. That's a good idea. I have to admit, Glenn, I did more praying after I asked you for a cup of coffee than before. And, but but that, that's time to pray. That's time to pray. Whenever you're dealing with a death in the family, isn't that a time to get sanctified? Be sure you're right. Whenever you're trying to decide about a job, that's a good time. Sometimes, you know, good things in people's lives. A lot of good things. Sometimes, 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 sometimes big things. Mm -hmm, big things. 
That's I true. Know. How about this question, John? Why did God start Joshua's career with this huge miracle involving water and walking on dry land? Why did he start it with the same kind of miracle that Moses' career is really launched with, with the people? Okay, he's proving that God that he is with Joshua just the same way that he's with Moses. I like that. What a way to pass the torch, isn't it? What a way to show that he's the successor. That we're gonna we're gonna do something here, and we're not gonna tell you exactly what it is, but you're about to see something amazing. And he's going to reinforce Joshua's authority. Let's continue our reading. I'm sorry, John. I was going to say, that's a good way to start, but I'm, I'm thinking about some of the things that would happen later on in Joshua. But to me, he's more spectacular than just crossing the Jordan. I mean, that was spectacular. I, I, I know I would have been in awe of seeing that, but there were so many more things that went to happen in Joshua's life that showed the power of God. There's a lot of other things that are spectacular about to happen in Joshua's life. Right, life, you're absolutely right. They're going to show the power of God. But he starts with this one. Um, what kind of spectacular things are going to happen to us in this, uh, in this conquest? In the, in, 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 in the words of Dr. Who, spoiler alert. Spoiler alerts. We're going to have hail. We're going to have hornets. We're going to have the sun standing still. We're going to have some walls falling down pretty quickly. There's going to be some amazing things taking place. Yes? We're going to see kingdoms being conquered. We're going to see kingdoms being conquered. Absolutely. And these, and these miracles are, are God's way of demonstrating his power in Joshua so that people will believe. Well, and, and these miracles are demonstrating God's power through Joshua so that the people will believe. And think about how this, this generation now they're not as prepared as, as I would like to think they are. But at least we've got a whole new generation now. And we're going to end this as we've been talking about Sunday night at 2 o'clock. This generation is going to stay faithful with Joshua. Their children are going to stay faithful to Jehovah. It's when the next generation shows up that they start to uh, disobey God. God has to send them uh, you know, has to punish them and they'll have judges over and over and over again. But this is going to be a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, event in their lives. We're going to see a pattern. We're going to see a pattern. We're going to see a pattern. Let's continue our reading in verse 8. 3 8. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you have, when you have come to the edge of the water, of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. So it was. When the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its bank, dur banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which come, came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap, 
very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. That's 16 miles upstream, folks. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the salt sea failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. So why God have the Israelites cross the Jordan when it's at flood stage, according to verse 14? Why would you do this at flood stage? Wouldn't it be a whole lot easier whenever the riverbed's almost dry to start with, when there's a trickle going through? God doesn't need a dry riverbed. Does God want a dry riverbed? No, no. He's going to part the Red Sea. He's going to do, he's going to, he's going to dry this riverbed up. He's going to let those waters back up into that valley. Yep. He, he's going to start a reservoir. That'd be just a 16 mile sea. It's going to be a 16 mile long reservoir. And he, God does not want it at drought stage. He doesn't want the river where you got to find one spot or another deep enough to baptize in, like Enon near to Salem, because there was much water there where John was baptizing in John chapter 3 or 4. Um, we don't, no, no, no. We want to be at flood stage. I mean, after all, with God, everything is possible. With God, everything is possible, John. Yes, God made all that water, and if God can heal the sick, raise the dead, and he can do anything, then that's, that's no big deal to God, but is it a big deal to us? Yes. You bet you. It takes a lot of good engineering to build a dam, and God doesn't need any dirt. He doesn't need any cement. He can just make a dam, and he's going to stop the water right there, and it's just amazing. Yes? What you just said, God's in heaven. He can stop it. He's, he is the God of heaven and earth, isn't he? And we're the ones in, on earth, so we may not be able to do that. We can't just uh, decide and it happen. We're going to have to do a lot of engineering. Yes? What's really interesting to me, it's nothing abusive about the water flowing around it and flooding this area. There's no mention of houses being destroyed. There's no mention of anything. It just stopped. It wasn't even flowing. Period. It says it's in a heap, doesn't it? Yeah. So don't necessarily, it's not necessarily spread out side to side. It's already at flood stage. It begins to heap. But because we're told how far back the heap went, 16 miles here, then uh, there is some natural forces going on here. I assume some flooding going on all that way back. But... Uh, the fact there's so much of it. Tell me what else is going on during during the flood stage of the Jordan every year. When does this happen? Harvest time. Why is God sending his people into the promised land at the harvest? Plenty of food to eat when they're conquering the land. This is going to be the time that uh, of greatest provision. So, well, you got to feed the sheep all the time, but this is when you got plenty of food to feed those sheep with. Yes. Adam is 16 miles up river from Jericho. How would you like to have lived between Jericho and Adam? That'd be something to see. How long is it going to take for all that to flood? I mean, a flood. Going that direction, filling up might be more gradual. I'm reminded of the scenes of, uh, oh, brother, where art thou? Whenever they flood, flood the valley and the water's coming in and you're in that desperate situation. And you, start, you see the cow on top of a cotton house. <laughs> if, you saw, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I, that, what a terrible situation to be in. Is anybody going to know about this? 
Is there anyone who missed this in Jericho? When the river is flooding and going past the city and suddenly it is dry? This is going to... And remember already Rahab has told us that fear has already been struck in their hearts by the crossing of the Red Sea is one of the things she named. And here it's happening again. Tremendous. Beginning verse 17. Then... This is going to be the talk of the talk of the country, of all those countries. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had completely, had crossed completely over the Jordan. Close to a million people likely. And it came to pass... When all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. And you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, so that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you will answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Now we're in 4 8. 4 8. Here we go. See at the top there? And the children of Israel did so. Just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them to the place where they, had, they lodged and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So why did Joshua have the people set up a monument? We stopped at verse 9. Verse nine. We're ready for verse 10. So why a monument? To tell your children. To tell your children. Uh, I, how heavy is the rocks? How big are these rocks? You've got to be able to carry it on your shoulder. So... How many pounds is your rock going to be? Two or three pounds. <laughs> I'm going to get me a hundred pound rock. Well, you said what I could carry on my shoulder. What you could carry on you. Well, no, now you're the, you're the you're the tough guy they picked out of your tribe. What's what's Arnie going to carry for us? A hundred pound rock, a nice big rock. How are you going to tell that this is a river rock? Well, how are river rocks different than just rock rocks? They're smooth. They're smooth. They have been smoothed by the passage of water and sand, and they've been polished. And you're going to get some big rocks, but they're not gigantic rocks. So 12 of these, you know, I, I'm thinking 100 pounds for me because uh, I might could handle 100 pounds in my 30s. I was at my strength, my greatest strength. And I just remember those 100-pound sacks of potatoes. Whenever I was 13 years old, handling 100 pounds of sacks of potatoes, levering them into a bin to make French fries. I'll never forget those, those sacks were like, they weighed more than I did. And somehow I had to get them in there because I couldn't take them out of the sack. He let the girls do that <laughs> who were making potatoes. But they made me pick this sack of potatoes up and... Because I was a guy, I could do that. It was very heavy for me. Why 12 stones? You can hurt yourself doing that. Why 12? 
12 tribes. Every tribe gets wow. one, right? Wow. So did you get like, I reckon they did. Um, in fact, whenever Joshua's writing this later on, it's there. Um, and Pardon me? That's an interesting point. They're, it sounds like right now they're in the water. But then we're going to be saying they're at Gilgal. They took them out of the river and put them there. But in this reading, it almost sounds like, but that's where the rock started was in the middle of the river. And, it sound, and, and then he, he set up these rocks in the middle of the river. But they're the rocks from the middle of the river. And they set them up there where they crossed. And then they're moving up to another spot. So, but this monument, they know where it is. The, read, the original readers, they're able to look at this monument. That's not the important point. The important point is, why 12? Did one tribe do this? Did only the tribes who crossed do this? No, no, no. The Gad and half tribe of Manasseh, Ephraim, they, they crossed the river. They brought their rocks too. The Levites, they bring their rocks. Everybody's got their rock. This is a team effort, right? Why out of the river? Because their part, they crossed the river, but God's the one who got them out of the river, right? right? This is a sign it's a miracle. How does this role spot, this miracle spotlight the role of the Ark of the Covenant? What's it for? It's a box you put the law in. What does the Ark of the Covenant symbolize? Because it's a gold box, it's a wooden box covered in gold with a certain artwork that's been described that we've never seen, but we imagine these cherubim with their wings touching over the mercy seat. Symbolized as God being with them. That's the very, that's the place they're not allowed to come except for. They're, they, these people will never see this ark again in their lifetime unless they carry it out in war again, like they probably shouldn't. But they're spending, this is supposed to be in the Holy of Holies all the time. Everybody knows it's there. It's all described. It's been seen by other generations. But it's, it's too holy. It's the place where you take blood and you sprinkle it into the very presence of God. It isn't God. It isn't an idol of God. But it is this magnificent receptacle for the original, for the second set of stones, for the Ten Commandments, for the omer of manna, for Aaron's budded rod. These precious objects are inside this box. But what's more important is when you put, whenever that, just the feet touch. The only Israelites who got their feet wet were priests. And they just got their feet wet for a second. Yes, John. Boy, that's a spoiler alert. Let me ask that question later. Okay. Um, What's, how does the miracle spotlight the priests? Are the priests important in this, this narrative? They're the ones who are the ones to carry the ark. They're the only ones who are doing that. And somebody named David forgot that later on. And Uzzah paid the price. How about Joshua? What's, this, what's the purpose of this miracle this way? In part... It's to glorify Joshua in their sight. Not to worship him, but to exalt him and say, this is your leader. Let me show you. I mean it. He's going to tell you what's going to happen and watch what I'm doing through Joshua. I have an approved leader here. We're going to continue our reading and finish uh, a lot of reading here in just a minute. So the priest who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed over like we're reading. Then it came to pass 
when all the people crossed over, that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people, and the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and of the half-tribe of Manasseh, crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests of the, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet touched dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. And he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall tell your children, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land, this Jordan on dry land. For you, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear your God forever." It's interesting to me that there are five audiences named, five specific audiences named for this miracle. In chapter 4, verse 6a, what's the audience there? The first one's in chapter 4, verse 6. This may be a sign among you. This is your sign. So the first witnesses are supposed to see it. What's the next one in the same verse? That your children may ask. So their their children, the next generation, are supposed to see. Are supposed to know about this. How about verse seven? And you shall answer them, the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the Lord, and when they crossed over the Jordan, these shall, stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So to the entire nation forever. Verse 7. And then verses 11 through 13. It shall come to pass when all the people completely crossed over, uh, the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, of the half tribe of Nassik crossed over, about 40,000. It's also for the people on the other side of the Jordan River. And finally, in verse 24, who's supposed to know this? The people of the whole earth. Gentiles, Jews alike. Everybody's supposed to know this. And that's what, the, that's what it's there for. Comparing chapter 5 and verse 6, chapter 5, verses 4 and 6, how many of the men of war had seen the Red Sea parted? Two. Pretty much none, but Two. Unless, if Joshua and Caleb may be a little young for men of war, but I believe that they are old enough. But uh, the most you can have is two. Chapter 5, verses 4 and verse 6. They were all circumcised because all the people who came out of Egypt were males. The men of war had died in the wilderness. They'd all died. So... Just Joshua and Caleb are the only ones who would have seen that. According to 424, what are the two stated, stated purposes? All the peoples may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord. It's for the Gentiles to see that Jehovah is powerful and mighty. He can do these things. And for you to stay faithful and continue to be 
believe in God. So here's your think about it questions. John, I have a feeling your idea might come up here. What do we face in life that is a you've never been this way before crisis or you've never been this way before blessing? You're my blessing, Glenda. <laughs> but uh, what, what kind of a crisis do we have like that? Well, when you lose a spouse, there's one. There's a crisis that most of us have never been through before. That's why we talk about Jordan being death. Death will be one of those. There are other crises like that. Anybody else been fired like me? Boy, that's something I've never been through before, and I'll never forget it. That's just tough when that stuff happens. Anybody been hired? Me too. That's exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. And you got hired there? That's exciting to get hired. It's exciting. What's a life-changing encounter with God you're going to tell your descendants about? Salvation. Definitely salvation. I don't know about you. I'm going to... I'm, my girls and my grandchildren... They've asked questions. They know all about my life being saved underneath that pew. There's one. There's, there's plenty of these things, aren't there? And we need to know them and, and hang on to them. What, though, is in your house, in your life somewhere, is there some kind of a memorial that somebody's going to see that and say, what's that? And it's like the 12 stones. I'm going to talk about a clock in the sermon. It's one of my 12 stones. You asked me about this weird clock with this weird saying on it. A gospel preacher who inspired my father to be a gospel preacher, who was a great help to me, who mentored me as a junior high student. He gave us that clock. And the fact that it's only right twice a day doesn't have anything to do with it. It's still precious, and it's a, a faithful child of God who gave that to me and gave it to my father to remind him of who he was and the kind of man he was. So, uh, are there things like that in your life? Sometimes in my life, I asked my father twice before. Mm -hmm. He wanted to get his own church. He said, no, nah, he got his own church. He go to Mm -hmm. Well, good. Well, here's, here we are. We're here at the Jordan. Sing it with me. We'll sing this new version in major key. I like the minor one, but we'll sing the major one. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Next week, we're going to get started conquering this land. Talk, to, talk about the commander of the Lord and an operation. We're going to start in chapter 5, verse 1. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. We'll be doing Joshua 